With the details of electrostatics firmly under our belts for uh, implicit solvent models, now is the time to take a look at non-electrostatic components of the solvation free energy and the models that are used to compute them. So again, I'm going to come back to my uh, rules and offer my last rule about modeling. We've already talked about erasing solvent structure and leaving behind a dielectric constant when it comes to implicit solvents. But electrostatics are only part of the free energy of solvation. And we really need to have some means to account for cavitation, dispersion, solvent structural changes if we want to actually uh, make a comparison to the full experimental observable. So if you keep your eyes on the nifty animation here, you see that uh, some other letters are appearing, alpha, beta, n, gamma. It'll become apparent in a moment what those might be. And I'm just going to mention that if along the way you can fix up errors or uh, instabilities in your electrostatic approximations, because remember, we don't know what the right answer is. There's, there's just some level of utility that can be judged. Well, if uh, you can do better on experiment by perhaps having a semi-empirical approach or a parametric approach uh, built into this step of going after the non-electrostatics, that might be good too. So, how might one account for the non-electrostatic terms? Okay, so, in red, because I don't necessarily favor it, there is the ignore them completely. So that might actually work for you if you're working with a polyelectrolyte where the electrostatic effects are likely to dominate heavily, but I'd say 21st century, this isn't necessarily the best approach. You can, in fact, attempt to go after each of these different physical effects with some model specific to that effect. So for instance, cavitation, there's a model called scaled particle theory that lets you estimate cavitation energies for building spheres into liquids. Dispersion is something you might be able to get at using atomic or group polarizabilities because a polarizability tells you how likely it is to induce a dipole on something. Solvent structural consequences, that might be a little trickier, but in any case, that, that would be an option. The dominant approach in the field these days tends to be to make an assumption that the solvent accessible surface area of a given atom or group will have some characteristic and transferable interaction free energy with the surrounding medium and it'll be dictated by the chemical nature of that atom or group and how exposed it is. And so given that we're talking about a free energy per area kind of interaction, that's the same units that uh, apply to surface tension. And so sometimes people will refer to these parameters that dictate uh, how much non-electrostatic interaction there uh, occurs for a given solute piece. Those can be referred to as microscopic surface tensions, or I'll call them surface tension functionals, as we'll uh, see in a moment why. And this is my own editorial comment as somebody who's worked in this area for a long time. Uh, making a continuum approximation immediately moves you to some extent into semi-empirical land. And so in my opinion, introducing parameters that improve performance is, is not a sin. So uh, let's talk about those uh, parameters then. If you imagine that I have some sort of a solute in gray here, when I roll a ball over a van der Waals surface, let's say, of that solute, that defines a solvent accessible surface area where the ball is meant to uh, represent the solvent itself. And so this blue area, for instance, might be a solvent accessible surface area. And the contention that I'm uh, offering you here is that you can roll over the atoms and ask, at this position, what is the surface area exposed of that atom? And then multiply times a characteristic surface tension. And that tension will depend on the atomic number. And if you'd like to be perhaps a bit more uh, sensitive to the difference in atomic interactions with the solvent as a function of being in different uh, functional groups, for instance, so you might imagine that the oxygen of an ether would interact differently than, say, the oxygen of a ketone. Well, then what you can do is 
run over all the other atoms and have some sort of a function that looks at the distance between the atom you're interested in and the other atoms. And if they're close enough to indicate that it's in a functional group, then maybe you'll modify the value of your sigma. And so that's a, a geometry sensitive way to take the chemist out of the equation but have some means to uh, recognize different functionality. And so this, uh, this particular function will be a, a switch that will say turn on when things are close and turn off when things get far away. And actually this switch is associated with a carbon-oxygen bond as drawn here. So at short distances, like, like would be true for a ketone, it's on. At longer distances, as would be true for an ether, it's off. So what are these microscopic surface tensions? Uh, so let me just simplify the equation and, and we'll work with the simplest possible one, which says that Maybe K runs over groups, maybe it runs over atoms. But in any case, everyone will have a characteristic surface area, which, by the way, is zero if it's buried, so that, that won't play a role. And if it's exposed, the more exposed it is, the more it will contribute, and it's multiplied times its proportionality constant, the surface tension. And so in the SMX models, which are developed here at Minnesota, and they're called universal solvation models for a... a reason that will become apparent in a second, we actually treat these surface tensions as surface tension functions. So each, each of these is not a value per se, it's not a parameter, it's a parameteral, maybe I could call it, uh, where the value derives from running over a series of descriptors and taking a number, this is a true parameter, that is associated with that descriptor multiplying the value of that descriptor, the superscript is just to indicate that it's tied to this descriptor, and adding that all up. So, so what are these descriptors? Well, some descriptors that might be useful would be the solvent index of refraction. And why would that be? Well, because the index of refraction tells you how polarizable the solvent is. So a very polarizable solvent, you'll expect better dispersion interactions than a non-polarizable solvent. Another one would be the macroscopic surface tension, meaning of the solvent. So that tells you how hard it is to pull the solvent apart, to make a hole, to cavitate. Two other parameters of some utility are alpha and beta, and these come from physical organic chemistry, and they measure the ability of a solvent to hydrogen bond, either as an acid, as a donor, or as an acceptor, as a base. And you can just go look those up. They're tabulated all over the place. So notice that the universality of the solvent model comes in insofar as these numbers are not solvent by solvent, they're universal numbers. So if I switch from tetrahydrofuran to water, for example, and I want to compute the CDS component of the free energy of solvation, I will still use the exact same formula but the surface tension will change because the properties of the solvent change, which is sort of what you would expect to happen. The parameters that are developed will stay exactly the same. So these parameters, of course, have to be determined from fitting to large bodies of experimental data, but that's pretty easy to do. What do you do? You take your experimental data, you subtract off the electrostatics to get what's left, the CDS. So now you have target CDS data. You know the surface areas. That's just uh, dictated by the size of the molecule and its geometry. And so now you know these sigmas are unknowns. They're linear in a bunch of unknown parameters. So you do a massive multilinear regression because you know all your solvent parameters. So these are the only unknowns. Big multilinear regression to get at these universal parameters. And when you're all done with that, uh, if you uh, look at SM8, which was a relatively recent model from Minnesota for a, a generalized Born model, there's about 72 parameters for 2,500 data and 91 solvents, and there's a mean unsigned error of about 0.6 kcals per mole for neutral molecules, about 3 to 6 kcals per mole for ions, depending on solvent. So that's uh, within so-called chemical accuracy, right? Reaching 1 kcal per mole on something in a quantum calculation defines chemical accuracy. A little bit bigger for the ions. Mind you, getting an experimental value for an ion is a bit challenging. You, you don't do Henry's constant measurements. You have to do some mass spectral things, and that introduces uh, reasonable uncertainty in the experimental values. 
So I thought I'd just illustrate what some of these solvent descriptors look like and how they vary as a function of solvent. So here's water, benzene, dichloromethane. So nominally very polar, not very polar, somewhere in between. And the dielectric constants reflect that. Big dielectric for water, very low for benzene, somewhere in the middle for dichloromethane. Water's a great hydrogen bond donor. Benzene's terrible. Dichloromethane actually has a little bit of hydrogen bond donating capability. Uh, it does turn out that benzene's pi cloud can accept a hydrogen bond, so it's got some uh, value there, but water is certainly better. The chlorines and dichloromethane are also weak bases. The refractive index, that's the N I had on the prior slide, is a measure of polarizability, so benzene with its pi cloud is more polarizable. Surface tension, very hard to pull water apart. It's got that beautiful hydrogen bond network structure, much easier for these organic solvents, and so on. So these are the sorts of parameters that might appear. And this is just comparing uh, various approaches to do uh, implicit solvation. SM8 is what I've been talking about so far. This is uh, the polarized continuum model as it was implemented in an old version of Gaussian. This is a different so-called continuum, sorry, conductor-like PCM as it's implemented in a different electronic structure code. This is actually solving numerical Poisson uh, uh, Poisson-Boltzmann uh, calculations in Jaguar. And this column over here is a very simple solvation uh, model. It says take all your data, determine the average free energy of solvation, and assume actually that every molecule has that free energy of solvation. What would the error be? These are errors that are being propagated here, mean unsigned errors. And so for 274 aqueous neutrals, if you look at the average salvation free energy over all 274 molecules, and you assume they all have that energy, you would have a mean error of 2.7 kcals per mole. And so you see SM8, a half, uh, Jaguar, Poisson Boltzmann's 0.9, the CPCM's 1.6. This older model, which had quite bad non-electrostatics, it turns out, actually did worse than assuming that there was no variation by molecule, so that's sort of a sad thing. Uh, Non-aqueous neutrals, the SMX models of Minnesota are particularly good for that. Uh, and ions, they so boldface means best in the table, red means you didn't beat, assuming all equal to the mean. Uh, but in any case, there's a lot of benchmarking out here, just as there's benchmarking for DFT models, lots of benchmarking for salvation models. Now, because we'll actually be using uh, these uh, salvation models at some point in a problem set, I thought I'd give a little detail on using SMD, so that's a Minnesota salvation model based on the density, that's what the D stands for. And this is for a particular uh, structure, it's actually a water molecule that is transferring a proton to this nitrogen of thymine while accepting a proton from this amino group of thymine. So it's water catalyzing the tautomerization of one methylthymine. And the way you do the calculation to get the salvation free energy is, first you do a gas phase calculation. So this is with the MO6 functional, and here's some energy, atomic energy, sorry, excuse me, electronic energy in atomic units. And I'll just point out the dipole moment to this system, which is neutral, is 5.4 to buy. Now I turn on the dielectric constant for aqueous solution, and I will discover when I'm done, it will be a lower electronic energy, so I, I favorably interacted with the surrounding medium. Gaussian will tell you what was the non-electrostatic component of that, and it does mention that I've already, it's already been included in this number, so this is the full free energy of salvation, this difference. And uh, the non-electrostatic is actually positive, positive 4.81. Notice that the dipole moment increased substantially compared to the gas phase. And that's always what we expect. If you put something in a polar solvent, it will polarize. And so if I take this uh, solvated electronic energy and subtract the gas phase electronic energy, the difference times the conversion factor for AU to kcal per mole, that's 627.5095, gives you minus 13.8 kcals per mole. So the free energy of salvation of this transition state structure is minus 13.8 kcals per mole. So, lots of polarization, but a significant non-electrostatic component as well. Last thing I, I just want to mention, and I won't spend too much time on it, but continuum models are parameterized against data. 
And of course, the vast majority of data that are available, Henry's constant data effectively, so solubilities of gases in liquids, are measured at room temperature. So the model, in a sense, is parameterized for room temperature. But what if you would be interested in a different temperature? So certainly a, a strength of explicit models is you just dial in whatever temperature you're interested in when you run a simulation. So what we would really like in order to put temperature dependence in would be to compute the free energy of salvation associated with 298 Kelvin. So this is an older model, SM6 from Minnesota, but in any case, it's still the same, same picture for how you do GCDS at a reference temperature. And then we know how free energy changes when you change temperature. It's an entropy term times a temperature change plus a heat capacity term times a somewhat more complicated uh, function of temperature. So that's just how free energy depends on temperature. So really what we would like to do then is take, this is a free energy expression, we want to have new parameters that describe how do these 298k parameters vary when multiplied times the appropriate function of temperature change. So this is an entropy-like surface tension parameter. This is a heat capacity-like surface tension parameter. So just as there would be a base 298K parameter, there would also be an entropy and a heat capacity associated with that. And uh, again, this would be derived from experimental data, presumably. So here is a, a graph of some data. So this is the free energy of hydration of benzene relative to 298K. So at 298, which looks like it's right about here, that's where that defines zero here. So we're looking at the change in the free energy of salvation. And so as we cool water down to its freezing point, the free energy of salvation becomes more favorable for benzene. And as we warm water up to its boiling point, it becomes less favorable. And fitting parameters along the lines of what I had on the last slide, uh, you can do various ways to, there are various ways to go after it. This is a final model called SM6T that involves seven parameters, and uh, that's for carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen containing compounds. In any case, you see this red dashed line really matches the experimental data extremely well. So that's a way to introduce temperature dependence into continuum solvent models, and there's great potential for that. The unfortunate thing is there's, there's not a huge amount of data against which to parameterize. And given that it's not terribly sexy to propose to a funding agency that you're going to do a whole lot of Henry's constant measurements at different temperatures, probably uh, to make progress on this, it's going to require some collaboration between people doing high-quality simulations who can look at variations with temperature and using those data to build high-quality continuum models. All right. Well, this really completes the fundamental details of the modeling of condensed phases. In the next two lectures, I want to really focus on applications and extend a bit beyond homogeneous liquids, which is what I've talked about really up to this point, and really see sort of the full scope of uh, application of solvent models to various chemical problems.